Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, I will start by apologizing because I am one of those who fucked up this planet big time. I'm in my 50s, I'm fat, I'm white, and I'm a, an avid supporter of consumerism, or at least I was. Uh, and to make it even worse, I'm the devil because I spent like more than 25 years of my life in advertising. So promoting stuff, getting people to buy more and more stuff. I apologize thoroughly. And now I'm trying to redeem myself by doing something useful. Been engaged with um, Climate Kick for a couple of years already and doing some coaching there. And my specialty I'm now teaching is uh, content marketing, storytelling, and things like that. You can always uh, reach me at my email address if you have specific questions or within Slack. Uh, I will be more than happy to help you. Okay. Uh, and one of the first things, and that's about stories, but it's also about presentations, and people tend to forget that, is that we, uh, when we are selling our ideas, uh, people must believe us, they must listen to us. So that first impression and the way you start is a very important one. One of the things that I struggle with when, when my students are doing presentations, it's always the same. They put an awful amount of words and concepts and ideas on PowerPoint slides, and they are under the impression that they are communicating, which is not always true. It's one, also one of the problems that we have with online communication. It's very hard to keep your attention focused uh, because there's no interaction, there's no feedback, there's nothing, there's only one person talking in a screen. And one of the most common problems that we have is that we think that our bullet points will solve everything. Now, the problem that we have with bullet points is that people can read way faster than we can talk. So by the time that I will be arriving at the end of this very simple four bullet point list, you're already finished. And moreover, you will think that I'm nagging because I'm going to repeat it. So that's the one thing that we shouldn't do when we are uh, presenting is using bullet points and cram them full with concepts, ideas, and everything else. Keep it simple, keep it very light. Because, and this is, may, might come as a shock to you, uh, you have a lot of things to say, but your relevance exists only in the intersection between what the other person wants to hear or is interested in and what you have to say. And in most cases, it's really disappointing uh, how small that intersection is. So the issue is not to tell as much as possible in five minutes, the issue is to remain relevant. Okay, how do we do that? You can tell a lot of stories, you can tell a lot of, you can give a lot of information, but if the person on the other side is not listening to you, then it's gone. So you need to look for connection. Connection can be found in several ways. In a normal one-on-one uh, -on -one situation, you can do it with your body language, you can do it with your eyes, you can do it with your gestures. Uh, but that is something that we don't have right now. Another way of making that connection and getting that connection is by using recognizable um, examples. This morning, um, when I'm, I always want to say Fabrizio, but it's not Fabrizio, that doesn't matter. The guy who uh, sold, you the, sold you the banana. Uh, was talking about metaphors. A metaphor is very strong because it's a very simple image that you can reuse and that people understand directly. I'm going to give you a small example, recognizable situations. If you look at me and I tell you that yesterday evening I was walking with my dog in my village, looking at my posture, looking at me, I think very few among you will think that I have a chihuahua. I've, not, I've got nothing against chihuahuas, but it's simply not the kind of dog that, that combines with me. Most of you would think that guy, okay, he, needs, he has a big, big, fat dog and they walk very slowly. But at least you have an image in your head. Now, on the other hand, if I were to say to you, um, last month I was in Tibet to open my chakras. I'm guessing that most of you don't have a clear image on what that would mean. And those who have a clear image 
would preferably not share it with others because it's very like Whoa. and that is what we talk when we when we talk about connection we need to have recognizable content that people can relate to and it's a very strong start that's why it was also suggested to start with a question because a question makes you think an anecdote makes you think a metaphor makes you think so these are all things that you can use the other thing which is important when you're doing a presentation is people have to believe you so you have to be authentic authentic is a bit of a an itchy word right now because it stands for very fluffy content but it's also being genuine, being authentic, being real, being honest about what you are about to tell. And that means that if you don't have the replies, if you don't have the answers, but at least you're looking in the right direction, you should be able to say so. Also, there's the advantage of keeping things very simple. Say, we are here, we know where we are, we do not know the rest of the, the trajectory, but at least we made a beginning. Showing a vulnerable side of yourself, those are all qualities that uh, make a certain appeal to an audience. This is all in terms to, or in order to connect with your audience. Vulnerability is a very beautiful thing, and it's not the same as being weak. It's just admitting that you don't know the replies, and it adds to the credibility of your presentation. Vulnerability, simplicity, and last but not least, structure. People think that storytelling as a business tool is about telling stories and improvising. It's not true. The better you know your story, the better you tell it. It's like with jokes. So I am, uh, I, you wouldn't say it because people think I'm very nonchalant, which I am. But when it comes to pitching and presenting things, it's about rehearsing. It's about knowing all the little logical steps that make a story uh, that the story is told fluently. So it's about rehearsing and finding the right words, the right um, transfers from one slide to another. Okay? So, and there is a, a misbelief, common misbelief, that it's only the extroverted that can uh, tell a story. It's about finding your own voice. When I do storytelling with my students, it's not about the theoretical frame. It's also about the theoretical frame, but it's mainly about finding your own voice, being authentic in the way that you tell the story. An introvert who tries to imitate an extrovert will not be believed. And an extrovert trying to become an introvert is a failure from the start. I tried it once at a party. I was dead, dead, dead unhappy by the end of the party because it's not me. I like to talk, I like to walk around, I like to do things. So we all have our stories. The only thing is you have to be able to tell them. Most of us have very boring lives. And in order for us to tell a story, it has to jump out of the ordinary. We need to be able to make the story a little bit bigger. You can do that by, by exaggerating. Exaggerating isn't lying, making things tangible. Uh, looking for the what if situation. Those are all tricks that you can use, but most and foremost, what is important is to look at things in another way. Be the girl on the right. It's not because it looks like a ballet bar that you have to use it as a ballet bar. If you see things the way that everybody before you saw the things, then you will tell the story that everybody's already told and knows. So you have to change and look at things differently. It's a very different uh, or a very difficult uh, exercise, but you have to try it, okay? So you have to improvise and look for the angle that makes the story worth listening to. Now, we're always, we're nearly halfway, but we should also think, what is a story? Well, I'm gonna try to define it by, uh, with the help of my mother. This is my mother. When uh, all this is over, I will give you the phone number of my mother and you can just call her and say hi. And she will start babbling. One hour, two hours, three hours, she will never stop. She's a very old, sweet lady, but she likes to talk. The story is not what she does. The story is finite. It's a beginning, a middle and an end. And you have to package it. If you don't package it, it's not transferable and it's not a story. It's like, yeah, it's a white paper and you cannot tell a white paper. Okay, you fall asleep with a white paper, but that's not a story. Second element, there's two, two phrases, two sentences that look 
quite the same. The difference between the first one and the second one is that the second one gives you not only an emotion, but also gives you a relation because the queen dies because she's full of grief. Therefore, you easily remember the sequence in which things happen. So in good stories, there, is all, there are always relations between all the different elements in the story. And the third one, you know this one, baby shoes never worn. What has happened to the baby? Good storytellers use images, images that appeal and that can be remembered. So to sum it up, and I'm going very fast and I am sorry for that, but I also posted some sort of a synthesis with uh, definitions and things like that. A story is a description of an event, an idea, which can exist in a, in a standalone way and has a certain structure, beginning, middle, end, or end using narrative elements. Narrative elements are heroes and villains, and they can be used in a very wide variety of things. The structure, beginning, middle, and end, could also be called the equilibrium, the conflict, the point of conflict, the solution, and the ending. It's important for you to know that a description is not a story. Every story evolves around a conflict. We used to live like this, and then this happened, and boom. So the disruption of an equilibrium is the beginning of a story. And a story should also touch us, make us, makes us care. And how does it do that? It can do that on three different levels. It can do it in a rational way, an aesthetical way, or an emotional way. The easiest one is the emotional one. How oh, my grandmother used to say, blah, 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 blah. It's a sort of a, yeah, it's a very soft injecting your personal history in a story always works, but it's not always sufficient. You need a rational part as well when you try to convince people of certain things. And the aesthetical part is especially in movies or in PowerPoints even, uh, it's important that you use the right visuals that are at least appealing or not repulsive. And I'm going to show you a very short example, it's, it's rather funny, uh, of the impact of the aesthetical side, for instance, in, um, in movies. I hope it works. Here's your tea. Oh, cheers. Did you put sugar in this? Yeah, I did. We assume the tea drinker isn't very happy with the fact sugar's been put in their tea, because the music is telling us this. However, if we replace the music with something else, we get this. Did you put sugar in this? Yeah, I did. It's the same sequence, the same building blocks, but the music makes it some, something entirely different. That's something that you need to take, be aware of. It should be cor um, correct on all different levels. And there's a method for that. We call it the cast method. It is developed by Microsoft engineers. It's a very nice book about visual storytelling by Sykes, Malik and West. And it's a very simple model, but we always do it wrong. It's content, audience, story and telling. First of all, we always start by the telling. If I ask my students to do something, the first thing they ask is, when is it due? How long should it be? And can we do it in Word or in PowerPoint? So they concentrate on the form and not on the content. And the content is the most important thing. You cannot tell a story if your building blocks aren't right. So the first thing to do is ask yourself the questions, why is this important? How shall we do it? When does it have to happen? And what if we don't? And if you have those things, you can also put them in another way. Then uh, you, can, you can find, for instance, in a business context, it's quite common to say, this is the problem, this is the promise, this is the process, and this is how we are going to do this. Uh, but it's a mistake to think that you have a story here. You have something very boring and very sequential. Those are building blocks. But if you have them right, then you can start building your story. The first, the second thing, to be aware of is the fact that your audience 
uh, we, we often make the mistake of not knowing our audience very well. You always have a primary audience and a secondary audience. The primary audience is the audience that needs to hear your story. The secondary audience is the audience that might hear your story. And for instance, in a commercial uh, environment, we are afraid of our competitors and we focus our lack of communication actually on the fact that our competitors are going to read along. And that's a mistake. You need to be very sharp and very focused. Not every story is meant to be heard by everybody. Just keep it in mind. The third part is the structure. That's the part where everybody fails all the time. And it's very simple. The basic plot structure is equilibrium. There is always some sort of status quo. And then that status quo is, um, yeah, there is a point of conflict which makes for problems and situations and then we try to resolve those and we go to a point of crisis it's never a linear process but if you respect those different steps then you have the start of a structure and a structure in itself is not always guaranteeing you that you're going to get there 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 is a research which has done which has been done and um on, on several kinds of business and organizational stories and they are basically to be resumed in seven different uh, types of stories the external threat overcoming the monster everything was nice and fine and then covid came by what did it do what did it happen what happened the rags to riches the from zero to hero story or the quest we are looking for ways to improve the way that we live together this is typically for product development or idea generation and all the others you can well, maybe self-explaining they're less less important the first three are the most important ones thinking of a scenario helps you building uh, arcs of tension in your story and that is important too and the whole idea is to get your your audience in a leaning forward position what is a leaning forward position is very simple if you say to somebody one plus one equals two they know that and they will not react if you ask them how much is one plus one most of them will say two so you get a little bit more engagement in the whole story. But if you start by saying, I'm going to prove to you that one plus one equals five, then you get the interest. And that's what it's all about. So leaning forward instead of leaning backwards. And then the story and the structure or the telling rather is uh, looking for the most adequate form uh, to tell the story. When you've done that, you're not finished. I'm sorry for the vegetarians, this is meat. I didn't, I, I didn't do it on purpose. But trimming the fat is very important. When you have your, your basic story, you need to think about all the things that you can skip to make the message and the story lighter. Uh, kill your darlings. It's not because you have an MBA and a PhD and you're working at CERN and you're doing this and this and that, that it's relevant for your presentation. The idea is key, is king and you are not. Kill your darlings on all different levels. The second one, this is, uh, comes from theater. Uh, it's what we call Chekhov's law. And Chekhov simply stated that if you show a gun in the first act of your play, you also have to use it. So every element which is of importance should be in the story and all the others should be left out. And that is a very, very difficult one. And you know why? Because context is a safe part of any presentation. Context is, for instance, research. Context is findings or ideas that you have on your own, and you start with those. But people are not interested in the context. They are interested in your idea, in what's new, and how you integrate those context elements in your story. And that's what you should do. So eliminate all the rest. And that's the, an old one. If you can't explain it in a very simple way, you probably don't understand it yourself, which is a danger. Uh, think of impact, your visuals, your words, your sentences, every uh, element that you have at your disposal should be used in order for the, 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 the story to, to, to grab the attention, to hold the attention. And you're nearly there then. The one thing that I will give you on top of it is punchline. 
I, when I write, when I make content, when I make movies or podcasts, the one concern that I have is how will it end? It's like in a joke. You need to work towards a very strong ending. And once you have that, all the rest falls from itself. And it, it will be remembered. And that's the important thing in the whole story. There is an interesting TED talk. You have to look it up. It's, or I can send it. It's uh, Andrew Stanton, who was one of the founders of Pixar, who is a very interesting TED talk on uh, storytelling. And it's his, it's his credo, it's his belief, and I think he's right. So this was in a very, very, very little, little nutshell uh, storytelling. And I want to end with this one. Shoot for the heart, capture the mind, and make them smile. It's got the emotional component, the rational component, and the style component. And if you have further questions, feel free, I'm there. No, I agree, though. Uh, publicity, so I'm going to take this one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Super interesting and also different from what we have been. Uh hearing uh, from our expert keynotes but also super useful i think in terms of uh, what the participants are going through uh, with their process through this climate on i just want you to ask one question which merged three questions that came up in the okay. youtube uh, while you were speaking and they are about um i will just read them to you but so what is the line between telling a story authentically and exaggerating it a bit so it catches the audience's attention? And how about the fact that when you tell a story, you also manipulate people? So what I was think- the, If you tell a story, what was the last one? How about the fact that when you tell a story, in a sense, you're also manipulating people? This is I what am, someone I, is asking. Yeah. Because, so how do we draw the, the right uh, balance? Uh, I'm gonna disappoint you. Uh, it's one of the first thing I always say Storytelling is essentially manipulating, but it's not wrong. Because if you tell a story, if you tell a joke, you want your audience to laugh. If you tell them about climate change, you want them to get involved. That is rearranging the information in a way that it touches and that it leads to action. So I know that the, the, the connotation of manipulation is like propaganda and things like that. But I think the, the fact that you are constantly thinking about how will this affect my audience benefits to the message. And that is important. And then the authenticity and the exaggeration, um, you can exaggerate from the moment that people believe you because then they they have a framework in which to take it there's a there's another important or a, a very funny uh ted talk with a guy who is very believable his name is um tim urban and he's a, he has a talk on procrastination and i use it very often as an example because he's very likable and then at one point he starts exaggerating but he can do that then it's a form of um of humor but when it's ill placed and ill presented to an audience that doesn't know you and doesn't like you then the exaggeration will kill your story so it's it's like style figures you need to know how to use them when to use them and they will benefit to the story and that's the i mean as a takeaway everything everything the story is the most important thing not the storyteller not the audience it's the story and everything should lead to that. Is that an answer? Yeah, I think so. I think that the answer for our participants is indeed that they have to manipulate their jury when they uh, will <laughs> they do their to. pitch. They, they have can, to convince it. They can try to bribe you. <laughs> I'm not the jury. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thanks so much, Guido. That was super uh, interesting and fun. Um, yeah, I mean, to our participants, Guido is also available on Slack. So I think I'm sure that if you want some extra yeah. tips, it, it will also be available for you. Good pleasure. Thank you so much, Guido. It was welcome. nice having you. Bye.